Is a dog may lesson just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta, or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Tefalology. Welcome to the third interview episode of Tefalology. Earlier this week, Matt and Matthew had the chance to speak with Professor Rod Ellis from the University of Auckland before a talk he was due to give in Tokyo. Professor Ellis is an authority in the fields of both second language acquisition and task-based learning and is the author of several books on both topics. It's important to note that the interview was conducted in a public space, so there may be some background noise in the recording, which at one point Dr. Ellis refers to. We hope you enjoy the interview. So Dr. Rod Ellis is a professor in the Department of Applied Language Studies and Linguistics at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He also contributes to MA programs at the University of Anaheim, as well as other institutions, and is a visiting professor at Shanghai International Studies University. His published works include articles and books on second language acquisition, language teaching, teacher education, and task-based language teaching. Dr. Ellis is also a great synthesizer of research, as well as being an active researcher himself. His books, The Study of Second Language Acquisition and Task-Based Language Learning and Teaching, have become pivotal works for practitioners the world over. We're currently with Rod Ellis at the Kanda Institute of Foreign Languages in Tokyo, where he is giving a presentation titled The Importance of Focus on Form in Task-Based Language Teaching. Uh, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to Dr. Ellis today. Thank you very much for meeting with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so maybe just uh, to start things off, if you could give us maybe a quick career history of you as a teacher, teacher trainer, researcher, writer. Not so sure it'll be quick. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, when I left university, I think the only thing I wanted to do was to travel. Mm -hmm. And so I took a job working in Spain, mm -hmm. in Santander, in Spain, uh, in a Berlitz school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I must admit I didn't like the Berlitz school very much. And I returned to uh, UK um, after about four months. Mm -hmm. Then I worked in a junior school in the East End of London, mm -hmm. teaching 10 and 11 year old kids. I stayed there a year and then I was off to Africa mm -hmm. uh, where I worked in a brand new Bush school three years after Zambia got its independence, uh, teaching English. Mm -hmm. um, after that I returned, did an MA, took a job for a while in Huddersfield, couldn't stand the pigeon shit, <laughs> and so decided to go back to Africa where I worked in a teacher education college. I worked there for another five years, came back to UK, did a Master of Education at Bristol University, then got a job at St. Mary's College in London mm -hmm. where I worked for a while and then moved to uh, Thames Valley University in Ealing. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1989, I decided to take up a one-year position at Temple University Japan. So I got leave from my job with Thames Valley mm -hmm. and went to Tokyo. Um, I taught there for one year and decided that life in Tokyo was somewhat better than life <laughs> in Ealing. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to stay, gave up my job. Um, after that, um, I continued to work for Temple University but shifted to Philadelphia mm -hmm. and worked for four years in Philadelphia. Um, and then from there eventually I went to the most beautiful country in the world, New Zealand, mm -hmm. and have never regretted it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and that's where you are today. And that's where I am today. Yeah. Okay. Great. When I'm not traveling. Yep. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and so obviously starting as a, as a language teacher, um, but at some point you shifted into doing research and writing about uh, language teaching? Well, I don't think it was a shift really from being a teacher to being a researcher. It was mm -hmm. really a shift from being a teacher to a teacher educator mm. to a researcher. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was that period where I worked in Zambia in a, um, a teacher education college mm -hmm. where I was very much a, a teacher. Mm. I had started to write textbooks then, but I hadn't really started to do any research. Mm. The research really started when I came back to England 
which was 1977. Hmm. So um, you've written extensively about task-based language teaching, uh, TBLT, um, it, and in 2009 you wrote an article about some of the misunderstandings of TBLT. Um, could you give us your definition of what TBLT is in a nutshell and what some of those misunderstandings have been? Well, TBLT centres around the whole idea of what a task is and that the task mm. should be the organizing principle for language teaching. So I've given my definition of a task as um, one requiring a primary focus on meaning, some kind of information gap, mm -hmm. learners have to use their own linguistic resources rather than be given them and then practice them, mm -hmm. and that there is some kind of outcome, communicative outcome, other than simply using uh, language correctly. Mm. Could, could you give us an example? Well, maybe especially of, of the outcome. There are many different types of tasks. Mm -hmm. so you can have very many different types of outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. One task that I often use deliberately to illustrate task-based language teaching is what I call a map task, mm -hmm. where I ask them to copy um, a map of an island which looks very much like a face. Mm -hmm. And then I say, I'm going to tell you where different places are located on this island, mm -hmm. and I want you to listen carefully and uh, write them in. Uh, that's a task. Mm -hmm. The primary focus is on meaning. There's yeah. a gap. I know where these places are. They don't. Mm -hmm. They have to use their own linguistic resources to process my input. Mm -hmm. And there's a very clear communicative outcome, which is the map with the places drawn on them. Mm. Okay. So that would be an example of a task. Yeah. And I often give that example because it's what I call an input-based task. Right. And mm. one of the misunderstandings is that task somehow means that you've got to put students into pairs or groups mm -hmm. and get them speaking to each other. Mm. And that is certainly one possibility for task-based language teaching, but it is not the essence of task-based language teaching. Mm. I see. Yeah. So, so in, in that particular activity, <clears throat> would there be a form that would be um, that you'd get the students to uncover in the task, or would it be a very unfair? Well, that, that takes us to another distinction between tasks, which they can be focused or unfocused. So what you're talking about really is what I call focus tasks, focus tasks yeah. which is a task that has been specifically designed to practice some predetermined linguistic feature. Perhaps practice is the wrong word. Set up a context Mm -hmm. for the processing of that feature. Mm -hmm. So that's a focused task. Many tasks are not focused. Many tasks are unfocused. The aim is simply to generate contexts for using language in a natural communicative way. The particular task that I describe, the map task, can be designed as a, uh, an unfocused task or a focused task. One way in which it could be designed as a focused task is if all the places involve the use of the sounds L and R. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that when the learners are listening, mm -hmm. they have to distinguish whether I am referring to a place which has L in it or mm. a place that has R in it, yeah. which as we know is a problem for, say, Japanese learners. Yeah. But I don't teach it that way normally. Mm -hmm. I teach it as an unfocused task. Mm. I see. Um, yeah, maybe one of the um, misunderstandings or difficulties people have with tasks is how concrete that outcome has to be. Um, for example, for example, a discussion on a topic um, would that would that fall under the category of a task if it's maybe the only outcome is is the students have developed their ideas on a specific topic. Well, basically. Basically, tasks can either be information gap tasks, such as the map task that I've mm -hmm. just described, mm. or they can be opinion gap tasks. Mm. So discussion really falls into uh, the opinion gap category of tasks. Mm -hmm. That is to say where um, students are given information and they use this information to try to arrive at some kind of decision. Mm -hmm. Another word for these is decision-making tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, discussion. Uh, Decision-making tasks can in fact be convergent or divergent, that is to say you can require 
the students to try and reach an agreed uh, solution to the task mm -hmm. or you can simply allow them to discuss and have their own opinions etc mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. I suppose what we often call discussion in a classroom mm -hmm. is more like a divergent opinion gap task mm -hmm. right. okay yeah. okay um, so you, you talked about this idea of uh, focus tasks and your talk mm -hmm. your presentation today is on the role of focus on form yeah. in task-based language teaching um, could you talk a little bit about focus on form? Well, another misunderstanding about tasks is that they don't really involve any attention to linguistic form. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that really is a complete misunderstanding. Mm. Because when tasks are being performed, there's all kinds of ways in which one can induce learners, one can attract learners' attention to specific linguistic forms. Mm -hmm. And this is true whether we're talking about focus tasks or unfocused tasks. Mm. In the case of focus tasks, then you will attract attention to the form that is the focus of that particular task. Mm -hmm. So it's likely to be what I call intensive focus on form. Mm -hmm. In the case of unfocused tasks, various problems may arise as the learners, linguistic problems, as the learners perform the task. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there are opportunities to draw their attention to those particular linguistic problems. Mm -hmm. So one of the main ways in which focus on form takes place is through corrective feedback, mm -hmm. although there are other ways as well, mm -hmm. yeah. which I'll talk about this evening. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the problems I find with, with my learners is, do I treat them as users of language or learners of language and, and when we give them a new, for example, a function, uh, for example, how to give an opinion, do we treat them as being users or do we treat them as being learners? So, so in order to learn the new phrase they have to go back to the learning mode, the kind of noticing way, or are they already users? Well another very important distinction that is really crucial to understanding task-based uh, language teaching is the distinction between incidental acquisition and intentional acquisition. Right. And this is relevant to your yeah, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incidental acquisition refers to the, the, um, the picking up of language while you are primarily focused on trying to communicate, trying to achieve the task, etc. Mm -hmm. Intentional language learning is where you make a deliberate effort in order to try to learn something. Now, task-based language teaching is primarily geared to incidental acquisition. Mm -hmm. And the focus on form that we were talking about a moment ago is there to attract learners' attention to linguistic forms so that incidental acquisition can potentially take place. In task-based language teaching, you don't predict what they will learn. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's quite likely that in a class of learners, different learners will learn different things as a result of participating in tasks, etc. Mm -hmm. Another distinction I make which is really relevant to the incidental intentional is the distinction um, between treating language as a tool for communicating, for doing things with, for achieving things, mm -hmm. as opposed to an object which can uh, be studied uh, consciously mm -hmm. and deliberately learnt, etc. Mm -hmm. So task-based language teaching aims to treat language as a tool um, and aims to cater to incidental language acquisition. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't mean that from time to time, learners, students being learners in a classroom and they're there to learn, mm -hmm. does not mean that occasionally they're not going to make some kind of deliberate effort to learn. Mm -hmm. And why not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And similarly, it might help sometimes if the teacher steps outside the task in order to assist them with intentional language yeah. learning of some particular point. But it should be stepping outside the task, and it shouldn't take over the lesson. Right. Yeah. Um, the, this idea of incidental language learning you're talking about um, reminded me of, of something that you wrote, which for me was one of the clearest descriptions I've had of the difference between the social-cultural um, theory, of the, that, that view of language um, acquisition and the interactionist cognitive approach, um, or the theory. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for a definitive answer, but just wondering if you were more predisposed to one, one of the other theories. Most of my work has been within 
what is termed cognitive interactionist theory, which is mm -hmm. a sort of input-output model. Mm -hmm. That is to say, learners are exposed to input, uh, perhaps the input in interaction, and um, as a result of that exposure, incidental acquisition can potentially take place. Mm -hmm. um, no problem? Oh, no problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I've lost the thread of your question. <laughs> uh, just the, the, the slightly different um, views of language acquisition that social cultural theory has. Okay. You know? Cognitive interactions. As I said, I think primarily my work has been within cognitive interactionist theory, which yep. views, which review, which views learning as taking place inside the mind. Mm -hmm. Social factors play a role in determining the kind of input that learners are exposed to, mm -hmm. but acquisition itself takes place internally. It's a mental phenomenon, a cognitive phenomenon. Social cultural theory, on the other hand does not see learning as originating inside the mind of the learner. It sees it as something external mm -hmm. uh, that is shaped through the interaction that takes place between people, etc. Mm -hmm. um, you ask me to choose between the one and the other, I don't actually see them as incompatible. Mm. Um, it seems to me that social cultural theory is convincing in, be, in, in claiming that um, through social interaction, we can actually create learning externally. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been entirely convinced by social cultural theorists' attempt to explain the other side, which is internalization. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when you come to internalization, then perhaps you, uh, you do need to start talking about the mind mm -hmm. and you need to talk about the cognitive processes that are involved. Mm -hmm. um, I see them as um, complementary. Mm -hmm. okay. um, maybe just ask, so today you're going to be talking about focus on form um, in your presentation later on. Um, I saw an article recently by a guy called Sheen where yeah. he said there's been some kind of misunderstandings between focus on form with a capital S and focus on form and form focused. Um, what are those misunderstandings? Well, Sheen is um, capable of very substantial misunderstandings. <laughs> right, okay. um, I would use the term form focused instruction to refer to any particular attempt to help learners learn a particular linguistic form. Mm -hmm. So form-focused instruction would include what is called focus on forms and focus on form. Right. Because focus on form, if it's accompanied with a focus task, is geared to helping learners learn that particular feature. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Um, so that's how I use the terms. Mm -hmm. okay. So to my mind, form-focused instruction is a cover term. Yeah. And it would include focus on forms, which is the traditional way yeah. in which we try to help learners intentionally learn particular mm -hmm. grammatical forms. Yeah. Focus on form, which caters more to incidental learning and is associated with task-based teaching. Mm -hmm. So in, in your, I think, maybe most recently published book on second language pedagogy and research, um, I think in the introductory paragraph you talk about uh, meaning focused uh, instruction and form focused instruction, kind of setting them up as as two separate things, but it, it sounds from what you're saying that both within any approach, both can be happening within the same lesson or within the same activity. Probably not within the same activity, because okay. a lot depends on how teacher and students are orienting to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I go back to my metaphor about treating language as a tool and treating it as an object. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, um, if you're going to try to treat language as a tool, as is the case in task-based language teaching, um, again, there's nothing to stop you occasionally treating a specific linguistic form as an object and and directing students' attention to it. Mm -hmm. But the general idea is to attract attention, yeah. not direct attention. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So um, I, I, when I make the distinction between meaning-focused and form-focused instruction, mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about meaning-focused instruction where there is no focus on form, mm -hmm. where the focus is entirely on trying to develop fluency, yeah. right? 
Whereas form-focused instruction would include both focus on form and focus on forms. Mm -hmm. So in the case of focus on form, it would involve the use of a focus task, mm -hmm. accompanied with various ways of attracting learners' attention to form while they're doing the task. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, so take for example uh, a time when a teacher has said, "Today I'm going to I'm going to take this particular function or form, and I'm going to put this before meaning." Uh, do you think in that case you're going to put, put so put that over meaning? So rather than thinking about meaning initially, they're going to think about I want I want to practice this form in this lesson. Do okay. you think that that can lead to heightened content development? If, uh, if kind of I, I'm not a purist. Um, that is to say, the reason why I support, promote task-based language teaching is because I see that it is absent from many classrooms, mm. particularly in Asia, mm. particularly in this country. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we find that students, uh, after six years of instruction, can do tests but really can't do much in the way of actually using the language as a tool for communicating, right? right. right? So um, I see task-based language teaching as an important component of any curriculum in a country like Japan, mm. but I don't see it as needing to be the exclusive component. Mm. In other words, I would envisage that there would be time for more traditional types instruction that would yeah. uh, aim to directly focus on forms, yeah. that would aim to directly teach uh, a particular grammatical feature uh, using, for example, PPP, present, practice, uh, produce. Uh, I've never been a purist. I mean, perhaps one of the things that um, proponents of task-based language teaching differ in is that some see task-based language teaching as an alternative to PPP, to yes. focus on forms. I have never really entirely seen it like that. I've seen it as an essential component, but there's plenty of evidence that to, to some extent, not always, PPP can work. It can actually help learners learn particular mm -hmm. grammatical structures. Mm -hmm. One other thing about task-based language teaching, it's not just aimed at developing um, linguistic competence, grammatical competence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also aimed at developing what's called interactional competence. Mm -hmm. And another way of viewing task-based language teaching is seeing as it providing an approach whereby interactional competence and linguistic competence can develop hand-in-hand -hand together. Right. Mm -hmm. right? I think that's much more difficult to achieve yeah. with PPP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Japan earlier. So do you think in Japan more more courses that focus on fluency are, are needed, essentially, where the the learners generally have a lot of kind of knowledge from maybe uh, high school or junior high school? And do you think in later life, perhaps when they're university students, they need more fluency building courses? Well, there are there are several assumptions that kind of underlie what you're saying, yeah. which probably need to be to be thought about. Yeah. One is that we need to teach some people some language first, and then we can turn to task-based language teaching to help them to use what they have learned fluently. Right. right? right. That is not a model of language teaching right. that I would agree with. Okay. In other words, I would see task-based language teaching as something that you can start with complete beginners. Right, okay. In fact, I would tend to see it the other way around. Mm. I think it's more important to show students that they can treat English as a tool, mm -hmm. that they can communicate with their linguistic resources, they can understand things that are said to them right. in English, etc. And when you establish that base, then perhaps you can begin to focus more on grammatical accuracy. So to put it another way, I would say fluency first, accuracy next. Right. But in reality, task-based language teaching is really about an integration yeah. of fluency work mm -hmm. and accuracy work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe just uh, for the last couple questions, changing focus a little bit. Um, you, you've written and you continue to write a lot about uh, second language acquisition research. and. Mm. Um, so just wondering how you, when you assess a piece of research, 
kind of what factors do you look at to decide how beneficial that piece of research might be? Well, the first thing to understand about second language acquisition is it's an enormously diverse field now. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't read everything that comes out on second language acquisition. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'd never sleep, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, so I, I pick and choose what I read. Mm -hmm. um, I might get interested in some of the later developments. One development in second language acquisition is something called dynamic systems theory, mm -hmm. right? Now, dynamic systems theory is really very different to a lot of other SLA research. It sits on longitudinal research. It argues that you can't really look at one thing in isolation from another. You've got to look at how factors interact to shape learning. It argues you can't predict how learning is going to take place. You can only retrospectively explain how it might have taken place in a particular learner. Mm. So I pick and choose what I, what I read. I mean, obviously, I'm still interested in task-based language teaching. So if there are some sort of articles that come out on that, I'll read them. Uh, how do I evaluate them? Well, I obviously look at them to see to what extent I think they're good research. Hmm. But if I'm reading articles that are published in some of the major journals, like Studies in Second Language Acquisition, Language Learning, Applied Linguistics, mm -hmm. the odds are on that they are pretty well designed because they've gone through a very extensive review process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm probably more interested in them for the insights that they can give me. You know, to what extent do they fit mm -hmm. in with my current uh, world view about task-based language teaching, to what extent do they challenge it, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do I need to rethink some of my uh, my current ideas in the light of what I'm reading? Mm. I see. Um, uh, a review in, I think maybe the latest issue of the JAL Journal of one of your books on on uh, research in language teaching. Um, I think one of the one of the lines that the researcher says is that. All teach or language teachers should read this book. Which book was it? Um, it was language teaching research and language pedagogy. Yeah, and it was reviewed in I think this the the latest Jalt journal. That came okay, out. nice to know it's got a review. <laughs> yes, yeah, very very good review. Um, I was just wondering if, if if you agree with that position that um, that it's a, a language teacher's duty to take an active interest in the latest research. I, I wouldn't want to say that teachers have a duty. Mm -hmm. to read my stuff. No, yeah, or, or other right? research. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, teachers can be very good teachers without ever reading my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, because what makes a good teacher is not simply familiarity with second language acquisition theories mm -hmm. or second language classroom research. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't really think that, that I would agree with your reviewer and that every teacher should, should read it, although I don't mind if every teacher reads it, <laughs> particularly if they buy the book because it will help my royalties, etc. Um, I think it would be useful if teachers were to look at it. I think that, that research... Um, I don't see research as telling teachers what they should do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a positivist in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see research as providing learners with insights mm -hmm. to make them think about their own teaching, maybe give them some ideas about something else that they could try in their classroom that they haven't been doing, right? Um, that's how I see research. I see research as helping to evaluate some standard pedagogic positions. I've published another book since that book mm -hmm. uh, ca called um, uh, Exploring Language Pedagogy Through Second Language Acquisition Research, mm -hmm. uh, together with Natsuko Shintani. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I see research playing a role. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily dictating what teachers should do, but maybe looking and getting them to question what they do do, yeah. etc. A good example would be in what many of the teacher guides say about task-based language teaching. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what people like Harmer and other Willis say, mm -hmm. they say that during the main task, teachers should not uh, interfere. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't provide any feedback. 
you know, they should be observers and assisters and helping sure that they do the task, making sure they do the task correctly. But they should not actually provide any feedback. Mm. Now that is directly contrary to what second language acquisition <laughs> research says. Right. What my talk is focused on form. Mm. And one of the reasons I've chosen to talk about it is precisely yeah. because people like Willis and Harmer say, oh no, when they do the task, it's for fluency work. And therefore, you shouldn't be attracting their attention to form. Of course you should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I think we have to stop there. Yes, okay. Uh, it's for just time about purposes. Time. Um, but just like to say thank you very, very much for agreeing to talk to Not us. Not at all. Thanks, well, it's Not at all. Yeah, it was a very enlightening talk. Okay. Thank you very well, much. Well, I hope it comes out very well and we yes. hear the conversation <laughs> taking place in Japanese. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to today's interview. We hope you enjoyed it and we'd like to thank Professor Ellis both for agreeing to be interviewed and for his insightful responses to our questions. If you would like to contact us, please send an email to teflology at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at teflology. We'll be back with a regular episode soon. Mm -hmm.